First of all, I'd just like to greet each and every one of you. Good evening. Good evening. And uh, my Havasupai language, it's, we say, Kamil. And I'd just like to say that uh, it's an honor to be here on, on this side of uh, what we call Turtle Island, this North American continent, my home, homeland to be here where the first light of the day touches um, the Mother Earth of North America. And it's also, of course, um, you know, special to, to the grandmothers to be able to come and share some of the teachings uh, that we carry with us in our life experience. I'm Havasupai. Have a still bot, which are the people of the Grand Canyon. And uh, my, that's my mother's people. They live down in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And have a still bot, it means uh, the people of the blue water. And so I'm from the water clan. That's what I was told. And then on my father's side, I'm Hopi, the people of peace up in northern Arizona in the Mesas, the Pueblo people and Tewa people who are uh, from New Mexico, the Hano Tail. That's my grandfather, paternal grandfather's side. And I'm from the uh, Sun Clan, Hopi Sun Clan, and on the Tewa side, I'm from the uh, Tobacco. And so uh, I was told that when I Wherever I go, I'm, I need to introduce myself that way, so that um, that you know we say the 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 origin the people of this land, the ancestral people of this land, the spirits of this land, <coughs> the people that were um, that lived here before the coming of Europeans, there um, that they will recognize that I'm I'm one of them, and so. Uh, so when I'm speaking about this, I'm not just speaking to you, I'm also acknowledging those, those ancestors of this land here, the, the um, First Nations of this land here. And so um, I just wanted to introduce myself that way. There are some things that we all have in common. And part of the work of the grandmothers is to promote this concept, this idea of of uh, our similarities as human beings, that we are all one, we are all related. And so if you think about yourself, that time before you came into this world, as you may even think about of yourself as if you were like a little seed, and you were inside your mother's womb, and you started to develop into a human being. You lived inside water. And so we say this water is very special. We have that kind of relationship with it. We lived inside water for three quarters of a year in our mother's womb. And when it was time for us to be born, to come into this world, the water, it came out before us and we followed it. And we say that's the first foundation of life. And then the next thing that you did, each one of us did when we came into this world was we opened our mouth and we took in this breath of air for the first time in our life, filled our lungs with this air. And when we let it out, we let our first cry, the first sound that we made into this world and that let created this vibration and we say you we let the spirits and this creation know that we are here through that cry through that sound and ever since then that's what we've been doing with this air moving it inside of us and outside of us and and through that making a sound expressing ourselves our feelings our thoughts being able to express the things that we need in life communicate with one another and others through our prayers, expressing ourselves through song. We've been doing that with this air ever since then, that time. 
So we say that's the second foundation of life. The next thing that, um, that happened was you, know, you, were, you were at home, you went, went into your home and they maybe built up the fire, turned on the lights, made it bright, make it warm, they say. Made it warm for you, made it comfortable for you. And then at some point in time, you had a fire in your house. At some point in time, they took you outside for the first time. The sun looked at you. And you the this grandfather's son, this great fire in the sky, looked at you for the first time in your life and blessed you with this day and has been doing that ever since then. So we say that's the third foundation of life. And then some point in time where your caretaker took you, laid you down on the floor, on, laid you down on Mother Earth, and at first you just lay there on your back. Somewhere along the way where you rolled over, <coughs> you lay there. Then pretty soon they took you and sat you up. You started to sit there on this Mother Earth, experiencing your body, your backbone, from head to toe, connection, sitting there. Somewhere along the way, your caretaker, someone took you, stood you up on your two feet, started letting you feel your feet under you. At some point in time where they let go of your hands and you stood there, both of your feet on this Mother Earth, experiencing balance and connection with Mother Earth for the first time in your life. You ever think about or you ever see what a child, a baby looks like when they stand for the first time? Isn't that a joy to see, to witness that? It's a wonder. That's what that child is experiencing, the wonder of balance and connection. To Mother Earth. And then at some point in time started to <coughs> take steps, started to walk, make their path. You made your path on this Mother Earth all the way up to this point in time right now where you're at. Your connection with Mother Earth, the fourth foundation of life. And we all have that in common. That we all have that connection with these four basic foundations of life. And as you continue in, in, in your life, begin to learn how to use them, use these things. And so, so when we talk, we think about this concept or this idea of you know, planting seeds for the next seven generations, you, know, you can go back to the beginning of your own life and think about, think about from you, the generations that come from you. They have that. They have had, if you're a parent or your grandparent, a soon-to-be parent, thinking about becoming a grandparent, wanting to be a parent, all these, these different positions of, of what life is, your role your responsibility. That's planting, that's the seeds. The seeds to, to, for this life to continue on. And, and so this idea, this concept of seven generations. So I was told I'm a seventh generation. I'm part of a seventh generation that has been complete. And so each, everyone is part of a seventh generation. You're gonna, that time's going to come. At least that's what we hope for. That's what the way we, when we say that, we're talking about hope. We're having this hope about that life's going to continue. There's more that's going to come. But we have to think that way. We have to pray that way. We have to hope that way. We have to have faith that way. That's what we have to have to have that, to look beyond today. Look beyond today that there's something more coming. Just like every day, every evening, the sun goes <coughs> down, we, all, we, we look beyond today and hope for that, that there's gonna be another day that's gonna come. 
And we always have faith. We, know, we have no doubt about it. Just have that faith that this day, the day, this day is going to close and we're going to go on into the night and in the morning time we're going to have another day come our way. Have another opportunity again to continue to see those seeds grow. And I was told by an elder of mine, I, worked with, I work with children, I work with all age groups, community organizing. And um, I was told by an uncle of mine, I was working with a group of about 30 children, and he told me, he said, <coughs> he said sometimes, you know, children are like seeds. And sometimes what we have to do is we have to take them and sit them down, plant them, connect them to Mother Earth again. So he gave me instructions, gave me instructions from that to do this, to take time out to do this sometime with the children. He said it's like planting seeds. And so, but you know what? One thing he didn't tell me was how old those kids were going to be. They don't, they can't, they, there's no age. It can be any, any person who has, <coughs> you know, the openness the openness to hear, you know, to participate, to see, and to be part of, to step into the circle, the circle of sharing, the circle of you know, acquiring new ideas or knowledge, that, the old knowledge. She said, and you have, it's your responsibility to take care of, you know, take care of these things that give us our life. Respect it. She said, you don't, when, when it comes to water, she said, we, you might see a body of water. Down in the Grand Canyon, we have the beautiful waterfalls, beautiful, pristine water. And she said, you see that, you come upon it, you look at it, you see it's beautiful. And probably the first thing people would look at and they say, I want to jump into it. And some people do, but they get hurt. And she said, we don't do that. You show respect to the, this water. You show respect. What you do is it, you go to it, and you put your hands into it and introduce yourself to it. You introduce yourself to it. I'm, I'm your child. You introduce yourself to it. And then when, after you've even introduced yourself to it, you touch it, you reach up, you bless yourself. <clears throat> and say, I'm going to use you. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I want to enjoy you. I want to partake of you. I want to feel you on my body. I'm going to come in. Introduce yourself that way. Then you go ahead and go in. You don't just run and jump right into it. You don't do that in your everyday walk of life, do you? Most of the time. You're cautious, you take time, look at what's ahead of you. As I guess in some of the cities, you know, they, they say you stop and look before you cross the street, like that. Same thing with the water. And she says, so, she said, this is, this is how you are, you, have, you be that way with it. And so, so these were, you know, the teachings that were given to me about how to, how to pay respect, you know, pay respect to the water. Every day in our life we do that. We use all these things, these elements. Every day when you get up in the morning, the first thing you do is go to water. Go wash your face, go rinse your mouth out, take a drink, you know, take a shower, use the water. But how often do you take a moment to pay respect to it, to take a moment to give a good thought to the water of thankfulness. Thank you, because when you use it, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? 
you feel rejuvenated, you feel refreshed, you feel good. It does that to you. But most of the time we don't stop and take a moment to say thank you to it. And uh, so that's one of the, I guess I can, one of the, what I can offer to you as what, the seed, a seed, a seed for the next seven generations to take care of that water so that the next generations that are going to come are going to have some when they come. The teaching that they tell us is, that, like I said, my mother said, you have a responsibility to take care of these things. And that responsibility is that you, you, you're going to take care of it and you're go- so that the future generations, you're going to pass it on or leave it for them so that you leave it for them and you keep it in good order. Almost even, as some people say, you know, better than the way you found it. You know, take care of it. That's what the elders always say. And where I'm from, Arizona, the Hopi people, they live out in the desert. They live up in the mesas. I don't know, maybe some of you have seen pictures or have been there. But you're driving out there in the desert desert. There's no river flowing out there. There's no lakes. There's no little streams of water. It's desert. And what the people, those people, my people, the Pueblo people, the Navajo people, the ones that live out there in the, that area, you know, you look out there and you Wonder, what do they live off of? How do they live out here? So, you know, they follow those original instructions of survival that they were given. The Hopi people, when they, they say, when they first came into this world, they were given a gourd of water, some um, corn, and a planting stick. And they were told, this is, this is what you're going to survive on. Take care of it. And when they were given, there were four brothers, the red, yellow, black, and white. They all came, they were all there. They were all given these four basic things. The Hopi people, they picked the smallest ear of corn, the humblest of all the corn that was there. They, that was what they picked. And they went out, they, they were out there at land. They planted their corn. And you know what they depend on? They depend on their prayers. They, have, they make prayers. They have to make their prayers to you know, call, on, call on the thunder beings and the, the rain gods, call on Creator. Send the water, send the rain, send that rain so we can have our corn crop, our gardens will grow, we'll have something to feed our families, we can continue to live here. That's what they depend on. They make those prayers. They, they, they haven't strayed away from it. They continuously have depended on their prayers, the prayers that they offer to bring the rain and then they to water their plants. I think they're the, the, you know, there's this term called permaculture. That's permaculture, I guess. The way they plant, where they plant, how they know the water run, how the water runs, they know how it all flows. It's all connected. So they, they, depend on that prayer. Then the rains come. And the rains come, it's... So this, this humble little corn that they chose, it has a real quick growing cycle. Because the rain doesn't come constantly. It's 
a real brief rain season, waters their crops, it, their crops grow, they have a harvest. So this is how they exist. This is how they, they continue to survive there from time immemorial. They have existed this way. And so they continue that. And part of that, the way I was told was that prayer they've been practicing. It's a, there's a prayer, that prayer that goes and that's in there and it's asking creator to bless the future generations. The future generations that are yet to come. The ones that we will not see. So when we talk about seven generations, those are the ones we will not see. And we as you know, the people today, it's incumbent upon us to think about those generations that are yet to come, the ones that we will not see. That's where we are here today, at that point of that responsibility, to consider that in all most um, practices today, you know, you have what you call us, maybe a five-year strategic plan, 10-year, 20-year strategic plans about a business, perhaps. But what about our basic, our basic uh, life survival? What about that water? What about this air? What about this fire? What about this Mother Earth? What is going to be available for those generations that are yet to come? You have generations. It's not just indigenous people. You all have generations. You're part of a generation. Why not think about that? Why not start putting that in your plans? It's so important. It's so important for us to, you know, take time to really think about those things especially today, now. So I'm just um, uh, thinking about these things right now, and um, for me, water, you know, that's been my work. That's my work, the water, to, to take care of it. You know, that's my responsibility. And, um, and so, um, uh, I just wanted to share those words with you, and um, uh, I hope that um, in some way uh, the, the, the words we're sharing with you tonight will be of some benefit to you in your everyday walk of life. So thank you very much. Thank you.